have indeed a distinguished panel representing all parts of this program from the beginning to very recent graduates. 25 years ago when the Promoting Tolerance program began, it began in a spirit of optimism, unity, and expansion of Western liberal values that we just heard um, outlined so passionately by Sabina Leuchthauser Schnauenberger. Many thanks to you and to Andy for your speeches that really set a tone and reminded us of where we came from and where we are now. I also thought as we saw that short, very impressive video, what does freedom mean? And we came to that moment where Hans Dietrich Genscher was standing on that balcony and said, I will give you the visas and the cheer that went up. And I admit, there were tears in my eyes. Do you remember, those of us <laughs> who do, it was a stirring moment and a moment that certainly far superseded just that particular balcony in that place in time. It was a moment in history that began something, the dimensions of which we, we could not at that moment really understand, but we knew something important was happening. And that's what brought together AJC and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, two very experienced organizations who decided, as we heard, to bring their expertise, knowledge, and know-how together to help with this emerging phase. And what a quarter of a century it has been. We have hundreds of graduates, some of them here today, from this program who have occupied high government positions, also some of you here today, and brought your experience into governments and civil society from local to national levels. But as we know, history is not an unbroken line. And the European experiment of ever greater unity suffered some major setbacks in recent years due to financial crises, unemployment, corruption, political disenchantment, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, incitement, hate speech, I could go on and on. We're fortunate to have four people with us today who can talk, address the issues as they, as they have experienced it in their countries and also in their work, which isn't always limited by the boundaries of their national country. And we'll talk, spend the next hour and a half discussing not just what you've experienced, but hopefully some solutions to ways in which individual countries and Europe as a whole can meet what in some ways at the moment is really a crisis of values and identity. With that, you've all just been introduced, so I would, if I may, turn first to Ivo Goldstein, Ambassador Ivo Goldstein. Each person will give a short introduction, and then we'll have a discussion amongst the panel and open it up for your questions after that. Uh, thank you very much, Deidre. First of all, I have to thank for the invitation both to Friedrich Naumann Stiftung and the American Jewish Committee uh, to participate, to be able to participate in this wonderful event. I was participating uh, together with Roman Jakic in uh, 95, but not in 1895, in 1995, uh, promoting tolerance program. That was exactly 22 years ago, and uh, it was uh, a different, that was different time, definitely. Uh, and uh, of course, I have to thank both organizations for being able myself to participate in other programs which uh, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung and AJC were uh, developing throughout these uh, two decades. Deidre, a couple of days ago, sent us a list of possible questions, what, we would, what she would uh, and we would like to uh, discuss this evening. One of them was populism. Populism is uh, quite a phenomenon. Uh, I am impressed by the growth and the, and the force of it uh, throughout these last years. Of course, I'm being, uh, what I would say, um, um, sarcastic. Uh, but uh, and I'm, I, will, I will try 
to give you one of the possible answers to the definition of what is populism, because we can discuss what populism is and give various definitions and try to analyze the phenomenon. Uh, well, I was born in 1958 and uh, living in Zagreb, growing in Zagreb uh, in, in the 60s, in the 70s, uh, and in, uh, as we were living in Yugoslavia in a semi-democratic uh, socialistic regime with uh, limited uh, possibility for express freedom. Uh, nevertheless, we, uh, and we were living a modest life in uh, terms of uh, economic life, uh, social life, uh, freedoms. Uh, but we knew that this year we are living a modest life. And it's better than the year before. And that the next year, it'll be better. So there was that atmosphere of optimism, and which was based on realism. It was real. It was not that somebody was telling you it's so, but it was there. Uh, unfortunately, this atmosphere we lack today. There is no such an atmosphere. I, I would say there is, it abandoned Europe. It abandoned America as well. When I am speaking, I think that uh, with, uh, I spoke with, about that with uh, Andy, Andy Breaker, with whom I know from, well, I, I, it was not 1893 or 94, it was 1993 or 94. So I think that we just, we, two of us, we spoke about the term American dream. What does it mean, American dream? So you have, of course, uh, hundreds of possible answers. And one of the possible answers is we uh, live, uh, of course, uh, one of the possible answers is that we are living uh, very well and that other, our kids, our children will live better and our grandchildren will live better and that we will feel that idea of progress, that it's real. So living in a constant crisis, Europe and the Western world, in general, is trying, people are trying to get some answers. They need some answers. And these, many of them need or ask for relatively simply answers for very complex and very complicated questions. Who is responsible? Who is guilty for the fact that my kids are living uh, worse than I am? living and I'm afraid that my grandchildren will live even uh, uh, won't live better. So one of the possible and very easy simple answers is of course responsible and guilty are the others. The others or the different. So you have a whole spectrum of uh, uh, possible answers. I read recently an uh, analysis of uh, propaganda of the extreme right in one of the European countries, and the conclusion says that uh, we can see uh, uh, extremely, um, uh, the, the, almost a similar way of expressing that propaganda in that country in the thir 30s and today. And you replace the word in, in the 30s, Jews, with the word Muslims today, and you have the same pattern, you have the same philosophy and same strategy. So this is what it is about. Uh, speaking about um, the other, one of the other, uh, that was, you said populism, the, the other one of, the, the other is um, uh, uh, revisionism, and I'm historian, I'm, uh, teaching when I'm not ambassador, I'm, I'm teaching at the university, modern history at the University of Zagreb. So, speaking about revisionism. Uh, revisionism is a historical concept which tries to revise history. Yes, of course, it's ugly way of revising history. It's, it's a lie. And it's speaking mostly about the Second World War, of course. 
but it is speaking about there was some not only genocide against the Jews, but there was some other genocide, mass crimes, mass killings throughout 20th century. 20th century is a wonderful century. Technological and technical uh, development on one hand, on the other hand, the, 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 the century of extremes like Eric Hobson said 20 years ago, and of course, age, uh, the, the, the time of genocide, beginning in 1917 with the genocide against the, the Armenians. Uh, so, uh, revisionism is not only try, uh, uh, an attempt to, to revise history. It is also the attempt to speak about new concept of uh, society, in which in this society, we are always we always have right. We were always right. We were always uh, we were right in the first uh, in the Second World War, and we have right now. We are right now. So, this concept of revisionism can be linked with populism. Can be linked with intolerance. Can be linked uh, 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 linked sorry linked with uh, bigotry and hatred. And uh, despite our hopes that at the beginning of the 90s, with the fall of communism, we will enjoy more liberty, uh, unfortunately, the space was open for more hatred. And after 9-11, this hatred spread all over the place. Uh, in Europe, for the first time in my relatively long life, uh, I'm not so optimistic as I was. I thought that optimism should be the way you think and you live. Uh, now, with almost four wars which are going uh, on in our neighborhood, and uh, you can count them, uh, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, uh, Europe is not a, any longer a, a cradle of tolerance uh, for many tolerance and cooperation and uh, stability for many reasons which we can discuss and we won't be able to discuss to finish this discussion in the next couple of days. So this is my uh, overview of what is going on. I'm still, I, I think that uh, there is no other way to uh, uh, to, to promote tolerance than to do this, what American Jewish Committee and Friedrich Naumann Stiftung were, do, were doing and are doing throughout all these years. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, without that program, the things would be even worse. And uh, of course, there is a, a, a lot uh, to do in, in, in future. Thank you very much once again, and I, I hope uh, that uh, in next 25 years, as Andy said, for in, that would be 2042, we'll be able to be more optimistic than we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn to someone who's currently in Parliament, after being Foreign Minister and Environmental Minister. Do you also have, are you dispirited or is there a feeling of optimism in the Baltic states that things are going ahead? There's always a feeling of danger lurking at the door, of course. Well, thank you. You know, Estonians are well known for their optimism. Um, actually, those of you who know Estonians might know that this is not exactly the truth, but when it comes to the populism and the possibility of, to fight with it, then yes, we uh, haven't lost our optimism. But I think that uh, when, um, when we discuss about um, populism, uh, then uh, people understand uh, populism very differently. Um, and then maybe it's uh, good to start with uh, trying to not define, because I think this is quite an uh, impossible um, uh, task, but just to give some characteristics um, uh, to the uh, populism. And um, for me, um, Populism is uh, something that continuously um, tries to uh, oppose uh, to, towards the elite, towards the uh, mainstream, towards the um, um, establishment. Um, but there is also uh, one more very important characteristic for me, and that is uh, that uh, the solutions um, they are trying to, well, 
um, offer, if, if one can say so. Um, well, actually, there are no solutions. It's mainly the opposition that is the core. So there are really no ideas over what to debate. There are just big slogans, um, and basically that's it. Um, it's also, uh, I think, quite characteristic, uh, not only in Baltic states, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, but everywhere, that um, the way uh, to simplify, uh, the ways to simplify the solutions uh, by the populists, um, I think it's, it's pretty much everywhere. And also, to, again, the um, constant attempt to um, create tensions not to offer solutions, but the more tensions there are, uh, the better. Um, so, um, why, uh, why now? And actually, I think it's also right to ask, is it now? I think uh, Sabina just uh, very uh, uh, beautifully explained that uh, uh, populism is definitely something that, not something that is a very new thing. Uh, in fact, I think it was uh, and is Harvard um, uh, who made the uh, survey uh, showing that uh, starting from 70s, uh, the right-wing populist parties have doubled uh, their um, uh, share of votes. And actually left-wing uh, populists have five-folded uh, the share of votes. And so it has started already since the 70s. So it has been the... Uh, quite a long uh, change, uh, not something that has happened during the last uh, two or three or five years. Uh, but still, um, I think it's very fair to say that uh, the, um, the frustration that uh, is in the societies because of uh, severe economic crisis is one of the main reasons. Um, and, um, and just as it was uh, explained previously, uh, when the crisis hit, uh, there was still um, the feeling that, all right, uh, it will be very hard, but we will live through it. And uh, sooner or later, rather sooner than later, it will be just as it was before. And uh, we will have the prosperous life uh, again. Now more and more it starts to uh, um, hit that that will not be the case. Um, and I think that the loss, or the, the, not, not the loss, but the feeling uh, that there is a loss of hope uh, is probably uh, one of the uh, worst things that uh, has happened. Um, um, and um, it's also uh, not so much the crisis anymore because all the facts actually that we see uh, shows that uh, in fact people have almost never lived uh, better than they are living now. But the perception that there is crisis, the feeling, uh, internal feeling that something is still wrong and still the level of life quality is, uh, is not uh, as good as it was and it probably will stay so uh, for a very, very long time. I think this is what has made the, um, um, the base uh, so uh, vulnerable for, for um, uh, populists and so well, good for populists uh, to come and spread their easy solutions. And yet, um, if, uh, if we think about, for example, Trump, uh, or if we think about uh, Le Pen, then uh, the main reason why people have been supported uh, uh, them is not the econo economical uh, reasons. Uh, the main uh, reasons are emotional, uh, even more cultural, I would say. Um, so I would... Uh, Put it this way, that all this uh, frustration that came from the economical reasons and from the economical and fiscal crisis uh, uh, have uh, created an excellent base, but now the cultural, emotional reasons uh, uh, have, uh, have actually um, been the, the, probably the main reasons why now and why not uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago um, or even earlier. Um, so, um, if the economic anxiety is, um, is so much there, um, I think the right thing that we as uh, politicians um, should be asking is how, how we deal with it. And um, I am 
convinced that there are uh, remedies also for uh, populism. And I think that one thing that could be, or probably is the worst thing, is to try to answer with the same means that populists use. That is, going uh, to offer very, very simple, uh, simple solutions to uh, extremely complex uh, problems. Because, I mean, the problems uh, that we all have to face in every European country are demographic. Um, demographic changes, which means that there are more and more elderly people and less and less um, labor force. Uh, also, uh, actually, I think it's uh, fair enough to admit that also globalization uh, has uh, created a lot of prosperity, but also, especially for some um, uh, sectors in labor force, uh, it has created problems. And for some sectors, um, have to, some sectors have to also uh, face with a very uh, intense um, retraining programs or unemployment. Also, new technology, which Estonia is the biggest fan at all. Uh, also, new technology, uh, um, also, I think, the uh, developments we will see during the uh, next uh, five, ten years uh, will not only bring uh, the um, prosperity, so to say. I mean, it will bring definitely a lot of prosperity, but again, for some very sensitive labor force uh, or some segments, uh, in the labor market, uh, it will mean that their um, jobs probably will not be um, the way that uh, they has been in the market for a very long time, which again only uh, fuels this anxiety and frustration that already is there. Um, and uh, so, I know how what to do? Um, I think uh, if there is one thing that uh, Nauman Foundation has uh, very successfully um, learned, uh, very successfully teached uh, to uh, Estonian politicians, uh, liberal politicians, is that if you want to be successful, you always have to lead and not to follow. So um, it's, it's so much, um, I, I think it's necessary that uh, liberal politicians will have their own uh, really complex and not simplified solutions at the table. And the solutions are there, for sure. Uh, what is also important is that, and when uh, I think there also the NGOs part comes uh, along, is that if uh, there are uh, some, um, well, let's put it mildly, fake news, uh, if there uh, will be uh, some uh, false um, lines that will be separate, will be distributed by the populists, then it cannot be uh, and cannot remain unanswered. I think this is one of the big mistakes that uh, a lot of uh, um, political forces have uh, made. They see that there is a, a fake facts, whatever that might be, uh, but, uh, and, and they do not respond. They hope that it will somehow go away. It, will not, it needs to be responded and it needs to be uh, said that this is, uh, it doesn't work like this and it's a lie. So this is also uh, <laughs> that uh, definitely needs to be, uh, needs to be done. And um, um, what is also sometimes, uh, I think, um, well, the reactions have not been the most uh, right ones, uh, are that if we do know that there is a fear in a society, then we simply cannot ignore it. I mean, the fear doesn't go away by just saying that, don't be afraid, come on. If I feel that, I, that there is a fear and I'm afraid of something, it's not enough if somebody tells me, don't be afraid. I want to, I want to know the solutions. I want to, to be convinced that I have no reasons to be afraid. So, uh, and if the fear already is there, then sometimes maybe it's the right thing to take a small step back and just uh, take those tensions uh, really seriously and give uh, honest uh, answers uh, to those fears. But uh, starting, when I started saying that I'm an I think, optimist, I think that um, it doesn't even take next 25 years. I think that uh, when we gather again in five years, or latest in 10 years, I think we will talk, not about uh, uh, a post-fact um, uh, world, but the post-populism and po post-populist world, I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Thank you for the inspiring ideas about taking a stand and doing something. 
We're going to turn now to Emil. You have a, a view, of course, of all of Europe as head of Liberal International. But if I could just ask you to start for a moment back home. You're from Macedonia. We've had some rather turbulent weeks. And it seems like a somewhat optimistic um, solution is emerging. So maybe there's one bright light here. How does... Yeah, m let me say it, it's not all that bad. <clears throat> but I, I, do, I do have a difficult task now. You give me a, a chance to speak after an extraordinary lady has spoken who has plethora of experience both in parliament and government in different sectors winning elections. <clears throat> and now I have to start saying something that should be interesting for the audience. I'll try to, to, uh, to be as short as possible and um, try to um, talk about some specific experiences that make me reflect how important this program is and also make me reflect how important this marriage of two different institutions in their very essence is. Friedrich Naumann Foundation is a foundation that promotes liberal policies, but at its very heart, at its very essence, it has the reason, it has the economic logic in the background, it has the facts. The American Jewish Committee is an organization based of a community that is built by spirituality, by faith, by belief, and the marriage of these two uh, entities together with these two philosophies brings such a fantastic opportunity for us to reflect, especially in the times as challenging as we are today. I will just say an example, and I'll say it in a, in a, in a, in a different way than I thought. Uh, let me try it like this. I arrived in Ohrid. It's a um, tourist resort in Macedonia, but also one of the oldest uh, towns in the Balkans, which had the first university in Europe. It is said so from the 10th century. And I arrived there with someone at the holy place where this university from the 10th century existed. And now there is a, a church that has been rebuilt on the basis of basilica from the 8th century and so on. There is a person at the door at the entrance. I say, what are these new buildings going on? He said, oh, we are rebuilding the, the university and the theological faculty. And I said, is really theology something that we need more to invest these days when people are so much suffering? He said, yeah, but you know, you have to understand your spirituality in order to understand your place in the world. So I said, okay, fine. Why don't you explain to my friend about the place where we are now? Tell him about what we are to visit here at the site. Um, he started explaining and he said, oh, you see, you will see all around the symbol of swastika in the mosaics from the ancient times. And let me tell you, this is not a Nazi symbol. This is a Christian symbol that has been used for centuries. So I interrupted him and I said, hey, wait a second. That was a symbol used by the Romans and not really by the Christians as such. He said, no, 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 no. It is a Christian symbol used by the Christianity all over. So I had to intervene yet again based, you know, not alternative facts, real facts. I said, Hold on a second, Tiger. There was a Roman Empire on the territory of the Roman Empire. There was Judaism. And then Christianity was developed as a religion. So, you know, the Christians took over from what was there on the territory. Let's talk about facts. He said, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong. Uh, forget about the, the, the Judaism. That's a sect. We are talking about religion and spirituality. So we are talking about the Christians. And forget about the Romans. To cut the long story short... The person I was with left, I continued arguing, trying to understand where does this mindset come from. And the person tells me, he said, hey, but why are you arguing with me here? I said, I'm not arguing with you. I'm trying to understand your logic because what you are saying is really terrifying me. He said, why is terrifying you? You are one of us. And I said, I'm sorry, how do you mean you're one of us? He said, oh, I know who you are. You're one of us. I said, what, what is one of us? Is it because we are sharing the same language? He said, no, no, no. I know you're Christian Orthodox like me. So why are you complaining about the story that I'm telling you? I said, but hold on a second. Are you aware that first of all, you don't know me because I never got to introduce myself to you. So you have an illusion. Who am I? Number two, what you are saying if I was somebody else, if I was Jewish, you would have profoundly hurt me. 
you, made, you would have made me feel miserable. Your words would have caused me to suffer and all that on a holy place. He said, but you're not Jewish. Come on, why are you talking about it? I said, but just pause for a second and think what kind of effects do your words have? A long story short, um, we end up saying and beg, me begging him, please do not say words that would make someone feel bad. You can have your opinion. You can have your vision of the world. You can think that I look completely different from what you visualize. But just do not make other people suffer with what you say or with your vision of the reality. It turns out that I was there last week and I was with my boyfriend who asked me, I don't understand you. Why were you arguing with that guy? What was the need for you to explain yourself with him? And I said, you know what? If you do not talk to them, not argue with them, talk to them. We ended in a peaceful discussion at the end, him agreeing with me that he would consider not to hurt the feelings of someone else. I didn't change his mind, but just I begged him, please don't make other people suffer with what you are saying. So he said, if I don't do that, and if everybody just turns around and goes away, what kind of society do we create? And I'm sorry, isn't it so that we should be compassionate one to another in the world where we live in? Or we should just have this attitude of, let things happen the way they happen, I'll keep on going my own way, so everybody will reach their own uh, happiness in life. I do believe that there is a profound message in what is happening. And I see that, I speak about Macedonia, which has gone through a terrible period of 10, 11 years of constant brainwashing based on a fear, and based on a fear of survival. The country, the identity, the people might not survive because the neighbors are not very well intended towards that part of, of Europe. So this, nourished, this fear has nourished uh, a mantra, a way of talking, a way of thinking that you have to think in something surreal, something superficial in order to survive and in order to resist the world instead of opening yourself, talking to the others, and trying to convince the, those who are not so well intended that actually your intentions are positive and you are aiming to create good understanding, good atmosphere, good relations with those who are living next to you. And I see this pattern happening all around the world. And I also see us, the liberals, not really caring about it very much. We love talking about economics, we love talking about figures, we love talking about statistics. We are smart, we are educated, we are privileged. But we simply do not show enough level of empathy for what is happening around ourselves. And in particular, you can see that in all the big cities where, incidentally or not, the liberals are gaining most votes in politics. Because it is this way of thinking, I have to keep on walking on my path, I have to keep my record straight, but what happens next to me, let it happen. And in that sense, I see also the answer of uh, this current fear. We, we must reflect whether in the future we should continue believing that having more is our objective, or having better is our objective. I'm taking a look at my family. Was it so that I was happier when a ch I was a child and I had a mother and father who did not have so much, but spent a lot of time together? Was it a better quality of life than the way my sister lives or the way I live today, having much more opportunities, have, having much more in materialistic terms, but in terms of human interaction, in terms of sharing with each other, in terms of supporting each other, I'm not sure we have improved our quality of, of life. And it might sound philosophical, but I do believe we are at this juncture in our human development that we have to reflect about this, because if we are going to project to the people hope about the future, the hope cannot be always 
the elections in the UK produced the fall of the pound in 2%. I'm sorry, but that's absolute nonsense. We should start thinking about how will that affect the life of the people in the community, whether they will be happier because of it, not only because their bank accounts will be better, but happier in, in terms how they communicate with their neighbors, how they communicate at work, how they cooperate uh, with, with the people that they should work with, how they operate within their own family, or how they see their own uh, sense. Um, I do see a great role for, the, for this project in the next 25 years, because the humanity will never stop. It will always reflect and reinvent itself depending on the, on the conditions that we find ourselves in. Kate mentioned something crucial. We are going to, after this crisis, we are going to go into the next phase of virtual life. We are even going to lose that segment of our human existence. And uh, there will be a lot of work needed to be done in order for us to comprehend and understand what is there in that rich forest because there is not only one tree there are so many different leaves in that forest and we have to learn to understand how to see them and how to enjoy the variety of voices that we hear thank you If anyone needs a campaign advisor, I think we have the perfect <laughs> person. That's a very important message as you're giving us, Emil, at a time when, as we know, many feel abandoned. Um, and the elections all over Europe, the United States, are reflecting that feeling of abandonment because the lack of interaction. And you mentioned, Kate, you also mentioned it as well. Last but certainly not least, our most recent graduate, um, you weren't so terribly optimistic when we spoke briefly before, Mate, but I'm sure you have lots of things you're doing that for us are definitely optimistic and a way to the future. Thank you very much. Don't misunderstand me, I'm very optimistic uh, despite of the situation in Hungary because as in the speeches before, Hungary and Poland always comes up as a poster child for everything that's going on, uh, all the bad things that are going on in Europe and uh, it's true, it's, it's an unfortunate thing that we have to be the uh, negative role models, basically. But I'm very, very optimistic that with the help of such wonderful programs as Promoting Tolerance in the following years, we'll turn the tide and we will come up as the positive poster child for once. But unfortunately, we have to face the realities that right now uh, we face very, very dire problems, both uh, regarding intolerances both regarding uh, populism and I do think these two go hand in hand. So I don't know how many of you have ever been to Budapest, but there's a very beautiful and quaint castle in, in the hills of Buda. Uh, unfortunately, the history of the castle is marred by a lot of uh, intolerance and terrible events. Now imagine this very nice castle and that the surroundings of the castle are befouled by more than 600 people, Nazis, wearing Waffen SS uniforms and the Hungarian counterparts of such, waving Nazi flags and uh, certain symbols. And uh, they are chanting the usual Nazi slurs and chants against minorities. They want a very strong figure. And now imagine that it hasn't happened in the 30s or 40s, but it has happened this year. So that's the situation in Hungary. Unfortunately, uh, according to most of the polls, Hungary is the most intolerant place in, within the European Union. Uh, a lot of, lot of people are anti-Roma, Roma being one of the largest, or not, if not the largest minority in Hungary, and we have one of the largest community of Roma in Hungary. But also more than 30% of Hungarians view Jews unfavorably. Uh, and we have a, a party, which is a neo-Nazi party, or goes back to a neo-Nazi roots called Jobbik, uh, a party uh, who is, for example, a members of parliament called for a list of Jews in, Hungar in Hungarian politics as, according to this uh, member of parliament, they pose a national security threat. Now, this politician uh, managed to do that in the National Assembly openly. And this party uh, started off as a very radical, uh, far-right, 
Nazi party, and now uh, they managed to gain some attention because of that. Uh, but now they realize that they have to centralize because they need more voters. So now this party is more and more getting central, despite the fact that the leader of the party is the same, same guy. Uh, but now they managed to, to gain the second place basically on popularity votes. So they are about uh, the second most popular party in Hungary. Unfortunately, the most popular party in Hungary is not any better. It started off as a central party, but now it's radicalized. So in, in most cases, it's more radical, if radically far right than the, our neo-Nazi party has been. This party is the governing party, Fidesz, which has a majority in, in parliament. So uh, our Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, for example, uh, in 2014 openly declared that he's building an illiberal democracy based on such wonderful countries as Putin's Russia and Erdogan's Turkey. Uh, so, but later on I will explain my optimism. I'm just <laughs> trying to uh, show the situation as it is. Uh, because we do have a lot of problems. Um, my theory is that uh, populism builds on two uh, very strong feelings. First is uh, disenchantment, and Hungary has a lot of those. For example, in, in the early 90s, late 80s, when Hungary uh, became a democratic country, a lot of people were very, very optimistic about, about things. More than 70% of people supported democracy and the free market economy. But, but the problem is that they didn't realize that they'll have to work for this. It, just, it doesn't just come out of the blue, they have to do something, take responsibility and work. Uh, this unfortunately was not realized, not, not a lot of politicians, NGOs and civil uh, society didn't really help in this. So by the late uh, 2000, this high number fell down to about 50%. And uh, when Hungary joined the European Union in 2004, this was the same. A lot of people thought that, okay, we are part of this elite group. Everybody is going to be rich. Everybody is going to be happy. Of course, it didn't happen because you have to work for it. So a lot of people are disenchanted with democracy, with free markets, with the European Union. Uh, and for that, people don't really like blaming themselves. And this is where the second part comes in, which is scapegoating. And, and this is what the populists managed to to rely on saying that it's not your fault, it's someone else's fault. So it's the fault of the Jews, for example, the evil capitalists who are manipulating from, from behind. And unfortunately, 42% of Hungarians believe that there's a, someone behind the governments who are pulling the strings. So there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on in Hungary. For example, one of the prevalent conspiracy theories in the far right is that the Jews are paying the Roma, so the Roma are committing violent crime so that the people will hate the Roma rather than the Jews who are, of course, doing financial crimes. And a lot of people, unfortunately, believe these things. So, unfortunately, a lot of politicians, populist politicians, realized that scapegoating is a very, very strong weapon. And uh, our government right now, Fidesz, is uh, basically finding a new enemy every time they are blaming the EU for everything that's bad in Hungary, for economic or other uh, issues, uh, they are blaming the immigrants, which uh, came very, very handy in Hungary. And now, on the most recent scapegoat is George Soros, the Hungarian-born American billionaire, uh, and the NGOs he's funding in Hungary. So it became such a problem that two days ago, the Hungarian parliament passed a legislation saying that every single NGO who is funded from abroad has to register. And if it sounds familiar, it, it's because it has happened before in Russia. And the Hungarian law is basically verbatim the same as the Russian, even the government uh, propaganda and the government communication has been the same as Russia. And unfortunately, that's, that's a dire problem we're facing because populism has existed for a very long time. If you go back to the Roman Empire, it has existed there. But now, unfortunately, there's a very strong country behind European pop and American populism, and which is Russia. And it's, it's in the favor of, of Putin to support far-right and even far-left populist groups who are anti-EU, anti-immigrant. And uh, Putin builds on the discord within the EU members and within society itself. Uh, and one of Putin's weapons, of course, fake news, which 
in most countries, the governments try to uh, try to fight or do something about. Unfortunately, in Hungary, the government itself is spreading fake news. Uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of media laws by our government, uh, and they manage to sway uh, the media scene in, in order to to favor them. So, 70% of the Hungarian media is in the hands of the government directly or indirectly, and they are spreading fake news. For example, against George Soros, one of the fake news was that George Soros wanted to kill his own mother, which is nonsense, but this is something the government openly does. And it's, again, as I mentioned, it's scapegoating, but the problem is that we liberals tend to scapegoat as well, because as I mentioned, that populist existed from the beginning of the time, and we use, usually say that it's the fault of populist that's what's going on, but isn't it, in a way, our fault as well that populists managed to get into government in many cases and populists managed to rise because we failed to engage in, in certain talks and debates and we failed to, to reach out to certain people. There are a lot of, of people who have been the losers of globalization and the losers of, of, of even free markets. And it's, I'm not saying that... Uh, I'm not saying that it's, it's such a problem that cannot be solved. I'm saying that we have to reach out to them. And unfortunately, I, I, what I've seen is we usually say that populists only preach to the stupid, uneducated people, and they are in a bubble. But so are we, unfortunately. We like arguing about, for example, Uber, which I'm guilty of that as well, whereas a lot of people in small villages struggling to find running voter. And I think that it's a huge problem that we fail to, to engage these people and uh, we are only speaking to our own circles and not reaching out. And I think that talking to other people could be a solution, um, talking and understanding what they are about and most importantly providing an alternative because I don't think that most of the intolerant and populist voters uh, would be inherently bad people uh, I think that they haven't found an alternative. It's been proven time and time again that, for example, if, if uh, there's a racist person, usually the racists haven't really met those groups they hate. Uh, in, even in the immigration crisis, a lot of, um, in a lot of cases, when people were near refugees, they tended to realize that they are not bad people and started to, to be more tolerant of them. But but we need to provide viable alternative, and that's where, so far, the Hungarian opposition failed, and that, that's the, the struggle we, in Europe and in America, really have to, to rethink that we have to, to provide an alternative and we have to engage those who disagree with us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mate. Again, yet more ideas about how to reach out and the importance of reaching out. Before we turn to questions, I'd like to ask you one more, just a little briefer, um, to think, go back to your experience in the United States, which is an important component of promoting tolerance. Um, we ourselves have our own issues with confronting bigotry and intolerance. Um, and although we are a melting pot and there's lots of impressive successes with the United States, there's still a lot of segregation, racism, anti-Semitism. During your trips, and you all went on different years and presumably to different cities, can you remember several things that maybe stood out for you where you thought, oh, that's something I can take back with me or something that surprised you um, and how did you integrate that experience of the U.S. into your understanding of foreign policy, the transatlantic component? Why don't we just... We'll, go, go ahead. Well, thank you, Deidre, for this question. I, uh, I'm sorry for not discussing that before when I was uh, able to say something at the beginning. Really, this uh, Promoting Tolerance program... Uh, uh, I, I came back from the States with an astonishing experience. I, I thought that uh, it was not my first visit to the States. This is one thing. The other thing, I thought that I know quite a lot about the States, not because I watch Hollywood movies, 
but as I have from information from this and that side about the states. And then when we came there and we were in, uh, not only in New York and Washington DC, but also, as I remember quite well, we were in Denver and we were in, um, uh, in um, uh, San Diego, San Diego on the, on the south of California, near the Mexican border. So I was really, not a surprise, but really astonished with the energy and dedication that some circles are making to promote tolerance. And then uh, we were uh, there in Denver witnessing the uh, Jewish-Chicano uh, dialogue about tolerance in, uh, uh, in the town, which is quite big, but not uh, one of the biggest American uh, cities. So in Denver and then in Palo Alto, uh, I'm not speaking about, once again about Washington DC and New York where the things are much uh, have much bigger importance. So uh, uh, seeing how uh, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung uh, pays attention to these problems and how in uh, Germany, which was also always a symbol for us uh, in the southeastern or eastern Europe as a uh, country which develops and cherish uh, liberal and democratic values. Uh, uh, and then seeing that in the States, uh, it was really something what I uh, brought back home and uh, tried to uh, promote in, uh, in, the couple, in the next couple of years. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have much success. Uh, this is what I have to say on one hand. On, one, on the other hand, I have to congratulate both organizations for tremendous uh, uh, work they have done in the last 25 years. So uh, uh, if there wasn't uh, that program or those programs, which were very similar other programs to, to what uh, uh, this program was trying to uh, show I uh, I have to add another thing that uh, I'm proud uh, that I was participating in a program which was uh, organized by Friedrich Naumann Stiftung um, that was ten conferences of Serbian and Croatian historians from uh, 1998 1999 uh, till 2005 so something like that so we. we uh, the Stiftung really made a basis for very fruitful and intense cooperation of two, uh, uh, two historiographies which has uh, have so much in common. So uh, uh, really, uh, visit to the States and the whole program was uh, left, from my point of view, a remarkable uh, uh, impact on my on my development, intellectual, both intellectual and professional. Thank you very much. Okay. It's I think it's quite hard to just select one uh, important aspect of the of the tour to the U.S. because I think the whole of America is such an experience that it's 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 very valuable. I, I very much like the attitude of Americans, the optimism and the can-do attitude, but. Uh, what, what's really exciting for me is to, to see how, how this sort of double identity uh, is working in, the, in, in America, that someone is not only Jewish uh, or someone is not only American, but they can be Jewish American or African American or uh, anything. It's, it's, I think it's very important that someone can uh, preserve their own identity and gain another identity which unites all of the minorities, all of the people, which is being American, which I think is people are not necessarily born to be an American, but it's, it's, it's a bigger concept. It's, it's, not just a, it's not just an identity uh, which you inherit, but it's something you achieve, basically. You can move to the US and become, become American. I, can, I could become Hungarian-American if, if I move to the, to the US, but uh, another interesting thing I, uh, I, I really liked in, in the trip I took to, to America, which was in 2015. Uh, we went to Atlanta, uh, where there was a, a museum of, uh, I think it was called Human Rights, but 
I'm not really sure. Uh, there, uh, there was a, a very good uh, place. I wouldn't call it an exhibit where you could sit in a diner, uh, in a diner in the 50s, 60s, uh, where you could have the experience of what African Americans had to experience during the segregation. So you had to sit in a, an old-fashioned diner in a chair. You had to put your hands into the counter. You had to close your eyes and put on some headphones. And uh, it was simulated how uh, the people there wanted you out because you, you went into a white diner. And it was very, very realistic. And I think it's a very important thing to, to let people show the, the perspective of others. Let them try to imagine what it's for them uh, to experience this hatred, this intolerance. And I think it's a very, very strong and emotional tool for promoting tolerance and to get to know others' experiences. I'll try the next one. Uh, I think one of the things I took uh, from, the, from the whole project was that um, if you put uh, people with so different uh, backgrounds uh, together and make them work together, uh, even if uh, at the very moment they don't uh, realize themselves, uh, it will influence uh, them for a very long time in a very good way. So uh, that was, uh, I think, one of the best uh, programs I've been on. Uh, and, um, and also, um, when it comes to the transatlantic relations, uh, then, uh, especially nowadays, it's uh, very easy to find those who do not support the similar cause or the similar values. Um, and uh, if you already have a friend or someone who thinks uh, and um, honors the same values, then uh, it's worth keeping it and investing into it. So uh, I think those are where the main things I took with me. Does it have to be one or now the microphone is mine so I can say whatever I want to say? Um, there are really a lot of, a lot of things that, that, that really make me smile when I remember it. Um, I'll try to be very short. First was in DC, the comprehension that different caucuses are not being monolithic, but they're going cross-party in dealing with issues that are so important for them, and they do not shy away to lobby for their, uh, for their protection uh, from discrimination. And uh, the, the, the fantastic part of it was that I guess I thought I would participate in a program which is with the American Jewish community, so it will concern only the Jewish community, but it was really broad spectrum, so it was really eye-opening. The second really striking thing was in LA, when we talked to the police, the notion and the comprehension that the police is there to serve the community and not to impose itself and introduce law and order and make the citizens be obedient, that was a fantastic way because we listened to them, especially when it came to the, uh, to the integration of the Hispanic uh, Americans, but also we had a, a huge debate among all of us from Central and Eastern Europe about how our reflection at home was about what the police is and what policing is. Then another thing that was really fantastic was we went to St. Louis and I was welcomed by this um, family during Hanukkah. And they welcomed me by knowing everything about Macedonia, have learned on the internet at that time a song they sang to me and I, I was really, I mean, I, I'm really having goosebumps when I think about it. I was like, wow, this is how one should embrace things that you do not know, learn in advance and embrace it rather than, you know, l look from the side, like what kind of differences am, am I now going to confront? Um, then it was a very interesting year for me because I was in run running in parallel on behalf of the, of the International Federation of Liberal Youth, the Euro-Arab Dialogue, and there was the promoting tolerance. So I was doing one month this, one month that, and I could really see the difference because the Euro-Arab Dialogue in the Arab uh, Youth Union, it was predominantly Libyan and Syrian diplomats, and I could see how horribly intolerant they were to anything that was different or to what they were supposed to say, to this project where there was really freedom to, to think and to reflect and to embrace the diversity. And last but not least, the Holocaust Museum in, in, in Washington. I had been in Washington before a couple of times, but this was the time when I really saw the Holocaust Memorial, and it inspired me to fight back in my country, I was uh, one of the key persons in the board to rebuild the Holocaust, or to build the Holocaust Memorial, 
Um, I was my, my, my heart was put in place when Rabbi Baker was there when I was State Secretary of Foreign Affairs and when we put the, uh, the, the, the grounding stone of the Holocaust Memorial, which is now open in Skopje. Thank you. That's very meaningful, first from AJC, because indeed Rabbi Andrew Baker, I know, helped inspire and bring together the coalition. And for me, because I'm from St. Louis. <laughs> so <laughs> glad to hear you had such a great experience. It's a wonderful Jewish community. Of course, a little hometown patriotism. But that's part of, I think, as, you, as um, Mate said, with double identity. It's one of the things that is very special about our communities, feeling completely at home in two worlds and not feeling torn between them. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Do, do we? Yeah. Hi, hi. Uh, Introduce I, yourself. Yes, of course. Uh, I'm Andre, and I uh, come from a wonderful country of Belarus. We actually invented most of the things that Marta mentioned even before Russians, and then they stole it from us. Uh, like registering uh, uh, NGOs who work for f with foreign grants. We were actually the first country to ban Soros Foundation. Uh, um, I'm this year a participant of the uh, Promoted Tolerance Program, and after hearing all this wonderful presentation, I started to envy myself for actually being here. But I uh, want to... Uh, go back to what uh, Kate said about uh, trying to confront facts to the lies of populists. Uh, I'm a journalist, and this is one of my greatest pains about facts being no longer valid. Uh, what we saw in Great Britain during this uh, Brexit thing, then the populists say lies, then they had a vibrant, uh, one of the most powerful journalism in the world, there in Britain. They print the truth, but it didn't work. You see what happened in the United States? Sorry. <laughs> uh, another case of wonderful, uh, best journalism in the world. And they cannot confront lies with their facts. We can see my part of the world where we have the fifth war that Ambassador Goldstein didn't mention, uh, the war in Ukraine, when we have actually one technically European country invading another truly European country, and they spread lies that cause almost the whole nation literally to go crazy. Um, so facts are no longer valid items of this huge information war that we are in the middle of. It's rather the ready-made uh, systems of interpretations of facts that are being transmitted. So understanding this new information reality, how do we confront it without, like you said, not uh, following the populist lead in uh, suggesting simple answers to complex questions. Thank you. So maybe we take yeah a number of questions first, and then everyone comment on what seems applicable to you. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Medini Sungur. Um, to add a little more flavor to the uh, run of countries, I'm coming from Turkey. Um, I'm uh, the executive director of a Freedom Research Association, a liberal think tank. We promote liberal values. Uh, my question is, um, um, so far, uh, I have a feeling that uh, the liberals all around the world have a certain tendency to, to neglect some hard topics like uh, security, um, which then filled by um, right now populist where other other uh, sorts of uh, extremist ideas as well um, should we as liberals um, neglect totally some of the questions posed by uh, 
some of the some of the populist trends in Turkey in 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 Europe and in the world in general, or uh, are there any res any lessons or are there any um, important points that we should take note of, especially in terms of security? Thank you. Yes, good evening. My name is Henry Rees. Um, a very interesting uh, subject, especially from a part of the world where they don't know much, too much about. Um, I'm speaking my capacity as Conseiller National of the French UDE. And to come back to the invention and intervention of Emil, um, I would like to hear a bit more about positive examples. And I think there have been positive examples to fight populism in the last month. Uh, take Austria. Uh, take uh, Netherlands, well, they don't, still don't have a government, uh, but the, the populists didn't succeed there. Uh, and uh, take France now, incredible populistic success, if you will, probably in four days, probably, it's probably even too much uh, success of uh, Macron. And um, uh, what can we really concrete um, do in that sense? Um, I must say, as we are speaking here at the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, it's sad to see, I'm also a member of the German Liberals, to see that there was, in the last month and years, more interaction between the German far right, AfD was already mentioned, and the French Front National, uh, than, for example, between uh, centrist and liberals from France and Germany. And you see now, Front National is, uh, they're nearly not quite dissolving, but they are really going through hard times. So this can change very quickly when we get our act together. So Emil, a bit more of concrete instructions how we should do that. That would be nice. Okay, well that, that is quite a lot. So why don't we just go start with Mate and go around, and comment on those parts that seem relevant to you. Okay, uh, first of all, um, Actually, fake news, the topic of fake news is very topical for me because in a month, uh, Free Market Foundation, um, the director of is going to come up with a guideline for journalists in Hungary on how to, to, how to tackle fake news. It will be available in English. Um, but we have so far seen that uh, arguing with truth is not necessarily resonating well with the people who already believe fake news. It, it, doesn't say that you shouldn't argue because it's a very important part of, of arguing and and telling the truth. But but also it seems that uh, education is a very important aspect. Going back basically to to the to the roots and not only reacting to to fake news but preventing it because it seems that a lot of readers, for example, only read the headlines and don't read the articles and with clickbait and a lot of misleading uh, titles, it can be a problem. Also, people tend to, to read articles they agree with and they will uh, affirm their biases and this is also a, a problem. But also, in a lot of cases, readers will, are not able to uh, distinguish between sponsored articles, op-eds and news and that's a huge, huge problem and I think there's a a very big responsibility of the editors and of the media there to make it very obvious and, and for them as well to educate their readers because it's in their favor to seem professional. Just shortly, a very um, short example in Hungary, uh, the public TV came out with the news that the Czech Republic is building an aircraft carrier with a Chinese, which is obviously nonsense, but they failed to, to check, fact check the, the sources. It turns out it was from a, a small Czech newspaper uh, meant as an April Fool's joke, but they failed to, to fact check it. So I think that there's a huge responsibility for the media to be more professional and to educate the public. Uh, I'm not actually, I don't really remember the second. The other one was security. Oh, security, yes. Security yes, uh, I think that it's, it's a very good point now. I remember that security is something that a lot of liberals tend to, to consider as a taboo, in, in, for example, in the case of, of immigration. Uh, sorry? Okay. Yes, sorry, I'm, I was speaking, I'm speaking from a Hungarian perspective. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> so in, in Hungary, Hungary being a, an entrance uh, to the European Union, 
a lot of people, uh, first of all, uh, started saying that, okay, of course, let the refugees in, but unfortunately then after they saw the polls, and the poll said that the majority of Hungarians, over 80%, are against the refugees, so a lot of parties started to have no opinion on the matter. And, and I think that, that that is the huge problem because, uh, first of all, I think that there's a legitimate debate for uh, who we allow or not, or, or not allow into, into the countries, whether I agree or not. We have to consider the, the legitimate reasons of the other side. But uh, I think that where we have must draw a line is, is at human rights. And there are human rights violations at, at, in Hungary. And now the, the politicians are, are too much afraid to, to react because of their, their popularity. And we have seen this as, as liberals in Hungary are not uh, being able to communicate well or not at all uh, on, on the issues of security, which has been a problem. And, and I think that that has been a very strong uh, point for, for Fidesz and the, and the far right that they managed to tackle this problem. And this is not only with the, with the refugee crisis. Unfortunately, in Hungary, this is a, a long-standing problem, but I'm very happy to hear that other countries are obviously doing so much better again. Well, I, I, I don't feel the, uh, a specialist in this. Uh, in in this uh, in these problems, nevertheless, I will try to uh, give some hints of how to approach the problem. Uh, yeah, I am uh, really s astonished and uh, frightened by the fact that uh, media today uh, are not um, accepting truth or information uh, as uh, as it's as such, but uh, they are creating some other uh, reality. Uh, for some particular reasons, and I um, understood that uh, everything is about clicks, number of clicks, how many clicks you have, uh, that's uh, how much money can you earn today or in, um, in, in future. So um, uh, the titles are just there to um, incite you to make a click, to uh, find something as an information which not uh, necessarily um, uh, is uh, uh, the title doesn't necessarily correspond or mostly does not correspond to what you have in the, in the text. Nevertheless, I, I, I think that the liberal society will find their way out of that, uh, of that problem. The other thing is... Um, about uh, uh, liberals and the security. Well, I can only tell you what I uh, know from the French example, which I am closely following. And uh, the campaign at its last stage, particularly when um, in the second tour, when Macron uh, confronted uh, Mrs. Le Pen, uh, didn't deal with security questions. Uh, I think that um, France, as a cradle of liberal, modern liberal democracy, a country with a huge potential in that, uh, uh, fr from that aspect, where French Revolution just uh, uh, made foundations for everything what we have today, or for many things which we uh, what we have today. Uh, I think that uh, even socialist government and Macron himself. Uh, address that problem in an in a adequate manner and that they uh, suppressed or limited uh, the influence of uh, Mrs. Le Pen. And that's how Macron won. Almost uh, he got two-thirds of the votes in the second tour, 66.3. So it, uh, it was really a, a, not only a victory of Macron, but a victory of her liberal democratic uh, society, which we all, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, welcomed. You can, in, you, you can imagine how. Um, I think just as uh, it is impossible to generalize when talking about politicians, there are so many different politicians. You cannot say that politicians as a whole and then give some examples. It's the same with the journalists and the same with the media. 
I would be very, very careful in generalizing uh, when uh, talking about media because not alone in uh, one country, but between the countries, the examples are so hugely different. Uh, still, I do think that before Brexit, uh, there was uh, some sort of um, uh, feeling or, 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 or understanding that uh, if there is a political uh, debate and politicians, uh, you know, um, jongleuring or just using the um, arguments, uh, then it's not up to the journalists to say if some of them is directly lying. So uh, now I think the understanding that if there really is a false, uh, I, ha I have some obstacle saying that it's a false fact, let's say the false uh, news or false arguments uh, uh, used, then it's also journalists uh, thing to put a label on it and saying that, hey, this is, uh, it's wrong, it's a lie. I think now it's uh, more and more um, used uh, to, to react like this. Um, and also, um, I think uh, it's o not only up to the uh, journalists or not only up to the media to do that job. It's also the politicians' tasks. I mean, if uh, just as you explained, if, if you see that something is going totally wrong, um, you have to react. You cannot just sit back and hope that if you sit s silently and doesn't do anything, it will pass. It will not. And uh, also, I think the social media's role is especially increasing in the countries uh, where um, the media uh, has some obstacles to do the job they are expected to do. So definitely social media uh, should be used and I think uh, will be used um, uh, more widely. Um, I was actually uh, among one of the uh, five foreign ministers uh, who initiated uh, the creation of a special task force uh, within the European uh, Foreign Affairs um, um, Agency or within the European Foreign Affairs uh, Office. And uh, it has worked now, I think, almost uh, for two years. Um, and one of the tasks of uh, this um, task force is to react uh, quickly and immediately when there is a spread of false facts. And especially on the um, social media, because social media is so much uh, quicker. Um, and also, I think the reach is uh, increasing um, enormously. Um, now, um, about security. Honestly, I, don't, I do not see why there should be any subject where liberals uh, are uh, not uh, taking the initiative. Also, the security. I think um, if there is whatever uh, problem or question that is on the people's mind, liberals have to offer their solutions and have, have to react. So also definitely with the security, uh, now bringing Estonian example, um, actually during the last parliamentary election, elections we had 2015, it was uh, the top issue uh, because uh, it's very clear that in the region um, security is uh, one of the top concerns. So of course it was also in liberal agenda. Um, and uh, about positive examples, uh, how to fight um, um, now, I don't want to step into the road and offer from my side very simplistic, simpli uh, simplistic um, uh, solutions, but I think that uh, one rule is simply not to underestimate uh, the voters' intelligence and not to underestimate the voters, so to say. Um, in Estonia, um, uh, you know, during the financial crisis, uh, we did, uh, and we ha had the prime minister's seat at the time we were leading the government, we did extremely uh, severe cuts in the budget. Uh, so uh, what we did, uh, we did uh, basically make a tour in a country. Uh, the politicians uh, did not uh, push back the uh, uh, officials and the bureaucrats. Uh, we did go ourselves uh, explaining why it is necessary to do what we are doing, how long uh, the pain will be there and uh, what will follow. Uh, I think it was honesty that was uh, rewarded because we did win the elections after that again, which was, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't happened before. Uh, that during the crisis, uh, the Prime Minister was re-elected again. So I would uh, say that uh, being honest, uh, explaining the solutions and not underestimating the voters' um, intelligence are basically uh, the key things. And... Um, 
but also uh, has been mentioned previously is the um, habit uh, to blame the Brussels or to blame someone else. I think it's uh, again just another example of populism. You say that somewhere are those, they, the elite, or they who control the things, and then uh, it's you who want to be on the people's side, but uh, who are simply not led to. So um, avoiding this, I think, also helps internally quite a lot. Kate, you made me feel good. You said liberals should have answers to everything. I'm a true liberal. I have answer to everything and there is no topic that I refuse to talk about. Um, you know about the, about the fake news, where did I, when did I start thinking more about the, the human touch that we need, that we are losing this part? It was actually during the Brexit campaign. I was doing the canvassing, going do door to door as they do in the United Kingdom, talking to people about uh, the devastating possible fact of Brexit and why did I think it was a bad idea. The receptionist in the building where I live, uh, I knew that he was UKIP supporter, so we never really interacted much. So one night I came at midnight, he saw me with all the stickers in Europe, whatever, he said, oh, you again. <laughs> and I said, you, you know what, let's talk about what, what do you think. So he was extremely negative, coming up with all kind of fake arguments or of something that you would uh, state as fake news. We concluded that night that I should come the next day with leaflets and information about European Union so that we can have argument and discussion. I arrived next day enthusiastically after work and he said, hey mate, you lied to me. I was like, what? He said, no, you lied to me. I said, what did I lie to you about? He said, we are actually paying 320 million uh, pounds every week to the European Union. I said, okay, come on. This is, why don't you go to the computer and go to um, Amazon.com. I said, why would I do it? I said, just go. I said, I don't want to do it. You do it. Fine. Went to Amazon.com. I said, pick a TV. He picked a TV, right? And there was the price was two to nine, scrapped. And then the price that was selling was 169. So I said, okay, if you click this, what will you tell your parents? How much did you pay for it? I said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, Let's buy this. What are we going to tell everybody? How much did we pay for it? 169 quid. I said, there you go. Because of Thatcher was such a brilliant prime minister of the United Kingdom, you have a rebate. So when you get a bill from the European Union, you get a discount and you do not pay 330, 20 million pounds, but you, have, you pay much less. I said, yeah, but the inverse is still the same. So then you realize that basically he does not want to discuss about reality, he just finds the news that comforts him. And it's not about the, the fake news, but it's about his feeling and how you're going to get there and try to address his fear and create hope from that. Or what is it that can motivate him to reflect? Past the referendum, I stopped talking to him, I was so cross. So one night at two o'clock at night, I'm coming home, he was uh, passing by the corridors and he says like, hey mate, you're coming late from work. And I said, I'm not talking to you. I said, why? He said, because of you, people like you, who do not want to listen to reality, we are now in a dire situation and the referendum collapsed. He said, no, why do you say by me? Because of you, I did not vote at all. And again, I have goosebumps. Um, and I said, what? He said, yeah, because of you, you sounded so convincing at the end, I didn't vote, even though I thought of voting leave. But can I tell you something? He said, yeah, sure. All of you live in this building. It's about quite a big uh, building. All of you have wonderful life. All of you pass by me. No one ever except you talked to me. I felt miserable. I mean, seriously, we pass by so many people on a daily basis, and we ignore them. We believe that they are completely ridiculous or stupid or poorly intended just because they find comforting information on the social media, not because that they really are poorly intended. And that's when I, I think that was one of the triggering moments when I realized, okay, Emil, just stop ignoring the world around you. There is much more that you can talk to about. And Henry, about the cooperation among the liberals, um, if I had the right answer to that one, or how to win against the, the, the bad populists, 
I would have invited you for this event to have in a nice chateau that I would have owned. I would have earned so much money from, 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 from consulting. But um, perhaps, you know, the French, the French situation, we have to analyze it from all different aspects. First of all, tell the French you're going to be like the Americans. They will scare, they get scared of such an idea that they would vote anything opposite of it, just not to be like American Trumpers. Um, perhaps that played a role. But we have to analyze all the conditions in different uh, situations and sequentially learn how to offer answers and how to engage to the people so that they know that we are talking to humans and we are not just going to use Facebook from now on to communicate everything, but we are going to talk to each other. So you know what, thank you very much for bringing us together to see each other and talk to each other and hug each other again, rather than having a virtual meeting on Facebook or something like that. No, I, unfortunately, we're, we're at the end of our time. So in concluding, I would like to not only thank each of you for your very profound insights, but encourage everyone in my very brief answer to the question of fake news and networking and to build on what Emil said. I worked as a journalist for many years and what I see is on the one hand profoundly unsettling. I mean, I, I couldn't believe we were just for, at our annual meeting at a hotel in Washington DC and in the bar, there's not a TV screen these days, there's two, one for CNN and one for Fox News. <laughs> Choose your truth. <laughs> um, and that's what everyone is doing these days. We all like to be comforted if we're honest. <laughs> and maybe we weren't honest enough in the past. Of course, everyone has their own point of view. And nonetheless, there are, when we say there are facts, facts can be challenged, but they're really, that's what journalists are there for, is to create a framework um, and do it with information that has sources. We need to teach people to look for sources. I mean, wh where does some of this information come from? They just make all sorts of wild assertions that has no basis in reality, including people who are very well educated. We all have a lot to do ourselves, each and every one of us. We need to train ourselves to look at information differently, to understand it differently, and in terms of the political arena, we need to rethink how we go about politics. And I think that's what we've been hearing from everyone, from the human touch, to taking people's concerns seriously, to thinking of more innovative ways to reach people. In a Twitter world, instead of fighting it, I would say, you know, maybe we need to get to the point more quickly. Maybe we need to get down to the essence of what the problems are. And that's the path forward. I'm American. I have to leave you with something optimistic. <laughs> so I'd like to thank all of you for your commitment and engagement. And big thanks to our panelists. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me again in thanking our keynote speaker, thanking our panelists, our moderator, and uh, the people who have organized this, my own team, and uh, Beate Arpet and uh, Julia Schaman from our office here. Thank you very much. Please join me in. Thank you very much.